You can go to our website at democracynow.org, but it looks like we've got the audio fixed to The New York Times in Washington. Juan? Well, we end today's show with investigative reporter Eric Lischblau, author of a new book that unveils the secret history of how America became a safe haven for thousands of Nazi war criminals. Many of them were brought here after World War II by the CIA and got support from FBI director uh, J. Edgar Hoover. Lischblau first broke the story in 2010 based on newly declassified documents. Now, after interviews with dozens of agents for the first time, he's published his new book. It's called The Nazis Next Door, How America Became a Safe Haven for Hitler's Men. You can read the prologue on our website. Eric Lischblau was last on Democracy Now! in 2008, after he and fellow reporter James Risen won the Pulitzer Prize for exposing the NSA's warrantless wiretapping, despite White House pressure to kill the story. He joins us from The New York Times, D.C. Bureau. Welcome back, Eric, to Democracy Now! This is, it is a fascinating book. Uh, you open the book by telling us the story of a man in New Jersey. Um, why don't you tell us about him? Sure. His name is Tom Subsikoff. Uh, he was uh, a guy who, who had many bosses over the years. He worked for the FBI, he worked for the CIA, and before that he worked for the Nazi SS. And that opening scene that you're talking about uh, takes place in the mid-1970s when uh, people at the Justice Department were starting to first become aware that there were ex-Nazis in the United States, and um, Subsikov was one of the people who had come under investigation. He had been living in the United States for 20 years at that point. And um, he went back to his, his old handlers of the CIA somewhat frantically because the heat was really being put on him over his past and these accusations that he was, in fact, a Nazi, which he vehemently denied. Um, and the, in the declassified uh, documents that I looked at from the CIA, there, there's memo after memo where the CIA is recounting these frantic phone calls and, and conversations with Subsikov, where he's saying, you know, what am I going to do? And the CIA is almost as frantically then uh, meeting amongst themselves to say, we've got a little problem on our hands here and it's going to get worse. And Eric, talk about uh, the CIA head, uh, uh, Alan Dulles, a brother of John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State under Eisenhower, and his role uh, in shaping this policy. Right, right. Yeah, Dulles it was one of the intelligence titans of the 1950s, uh, one of the, the original Cold Warriors. Uh, and he was someone who believed uh, that there were, quote-unquote, moderate Nazis, his words, who the U.S. could use to its advantage in the Cold War. And he um, actively recruited them himself and, and, in a number of cases, intervened on their behalf when they were facing accusations about their past, about their involvement. In, in Nazi war crimes, uh, and he and J. Edgar Hoover were really the two, the two linchpins in this, in, in developing this strategy of, of recruiting ex-Nazis as cold warriors, as, as Soviet, uh, anti-Soviet assets who they believe could, could gather intelligence for the U.S. Now, the irony is that a lot of these guys, a lot of these ex-Nazis used as spies by the CIA, by the FBI, really turned out to be bad spies. Uh, there, there are all sorts of files that I examined showing that they, not, not shockingly in hindsight, that the Nazis were found to be uh, liars and cheats and embezzlers, and in a couple of cases, they're even found to be Soviet double agents. So not only do they have the incredible baggage of being Nazis, but, uh, but they were not even good spies. I mean, the story you tell of Alan Dulles um, meeting with Nazi General Karl Wolf in Switzerland. Um, he right. was the number two man, right, for Himmler. Explain the deal that they were making. And then talk about the scientists that were recruited. I just flew back from Austria and sat next to uh, a man who lives in Vienna, who grew up in northern New Jersey. And he said his father was brought from, by, from Germany by the CIA to northern New Jersey because he was a scientist and they wanted him here, not in Russia. Right. Well, uh, starting with the scientists, um, we brought over under something called Program Paperclip about 1,600 Nazi scientists. Um, these were engineers, uh, doctors, uh, jet propulsion experts, things like that. The most famous among them was Werner von Braun, who uh, was, was one of the, uh, the guiding hands in getting us to the moon in 1969. Uh, and officially, under the policies put in place by Truman and Eisenhower after the war, these were not supposed to be, quote-unquote, ardent Nazis, whatever that may mean. 
But, you know, in fact, these are people who, who were directly involved in, for instance, uh, running slave labor factories where thousands and thousands of people uh, died in making Hitler's rockets. Um, these were doctors who were involved in medical atrocities. They then found homes in the United States as, uh, as American scientists. Many of them became U.S. citizens. Many of them became honored for their work in the United States. Uh, as far as Alan Dulles, who you asked about, um, yeah, his role in, in um, having negotiations and conversations with, with Nazis began even before the war was over, believe it or not. A few months before the war, there was a meeting that I, that I uh, talk about in the book where he met uh, at a safe house in Zurich with Himmler's ex-chief of staff, who um, was trying to save his own skin. He realized the war was about to be over in a few months, and he was uh, understandably afraid of being charged in all sorts of war crimes. This was Himmler's chief of staff. He was involved in setting up the train network that, that led uh, millions of Jews and others to their deaths. And uh, Dulles thought that, that uh, this general, General Karl Wolf, could help end the war earlier. Um, as it turned out, they, end, they ended the war maybe two weeks earlier uh, in, the, in the region in Italy that Wolf controlled. But um, as part of these negotiations, they, they, they were uh, sipping, sipping scotch over a lovely fireside in Zurich. Uh, for months and months after the war, even, even for the first couple of years, Dulles really effectively protected General, General Wolf, Himmler's ex chief of staff, from war crimes charges. Um, and uh, uh, Wolf went from being a, a chief defendant, one of the top uh, Nazi defendants at Nuremberg, to being merely a witness and served virtually no time in, in prison. In fact, even when he was uh, nominally a, a prisoner in, in a uh, P as a POW, he was allowed to wear a gun. He went boating on the weekends in Austria. Um, he led sort of a charmed life after the war, thanks to the help of, of uh, Alan Dulles, who went on to become the first director of the CIA. Uh, Eric, one of the heroes of your stories is a re of your book is a, re a reporter named Chuck Allen, who first yeah. began exposing uh, this uh, this underground railroad of evildoers uh, into the United States, uh, and uh, but who was uh, at first uh, for many years ignored. Could talk about him. Right, right. I had never heard of Chuck Allen when I started my, my research, but he became sort of a hero of mine as I was writing this book. He, he was a, a left-wing journalist in the, in the early 1960s, writing for obscure uh, Jewish publications, sometimes communist-leaning publications. And he started writing exhaustively in the early 1960s about uh, the fact, which was really unknown at the time, that there were Nazis and Nazi collaborators living openly in the United States. He wrote in 1963 an, an exhaustive 40-page uh, piece uh, for uh, a magazine called Jewish Currents, which was affiliated with the Communist Party. Uh, and in it, he document, documented the, the role of, uh, for instance, a, 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 a bishop in Chicago and uh, a State Department analyst who had clear ties to the Nazis and atrocities. And he was not only ignored, as, as, as you say, sort of it, written off as some left-wing kook, but uh, at the FBI, they, they, they started paying attention to the point that J. Edgar Hoover um, Ordered, his, ordered him to be wiretapped for a number of years, and, and you had FBI agents trailing him as he would try and gather evidence on Nazi atrocities by, uh, by people inside the United States. So he was, he was seen as a subversive, as, as a, a communist plant, um, and uh, was, was either ignored or shunned or actually retaliated against for writing these things in the 1960s. And this was a time when really no one else noticed or cared that there were, at that point, hundreds, thousands of Nazis living openly in the United States. So he was being, um, while he may have been ignored by the public, he was being harassed by the FBI Absolutely. at the same time that the FBI and the CIA were protecting these Nazis. Another amazing part of the story is how so many of the those in the concentration camps afterwards, the allies were running these concentration camps, and the, right. uh, the Jews were there. And often the Nazi POWs in these camps would be put in charge of them by the United States. 
Right, right. No, I'm glad you asked about that. I mean, that, that was probably the single most striking thing to me in my research. There were a lot of alarming things that I came across that I didn't know when I started writing this book. But I think the most, the most repugnant of all the repugnant things was the treatment of the survivors, not just, not just Jews, but uh, communists, uh, gays, uh, Roma, and others who, were, who survived the Holocaust, but for months and in some cases a couple of years after the end of the war were still kept inside the concentration camps themselves, um, under uh, behind barbed wire, under armed guard, sometimes under the supervision of other P of other Nazi POWs, um, and uh, it was uh, I learned it was General Patton, a war hero, old blood and guts they called him, who oversaw the camps. He was the the, the supreme Allied commander after the war. Uh, and he, I looked at his his journals. Uh, he was a virulent anti-Semite, um, and he, there there was a, a scathing report to Truman uh, by um, a, an emissary of Truman's uh, from the University of Pennsylvania, Earl Harrison, that compared the the camps that the United States was running after the war to the Nazi concentration camps. He said the Harrison wrote that the only difference is that we're not exterminating the Jews, which you know think of that in hindsight. Uh, Patton, Eric, Eric yes. which is why we have to um, end the show, but we want to ask sure. if you can stay, and we'll put part two online at democracynow.org. The Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter for The New York Times, his new book published this week, The Nazis Next Door, How America Became a Safe Haven for Hitler's Men. You can read the prologue at democracynow.org.